I want to begin this next segment um, by reading the open letter from Jewish leaders in Pittsburgh to President Trump. They said, President Trump, for the past three years, your words and your policies have emboldened a growing white nationalist movement. You yourself call the murderer evil. But yesterday's violence is the direct culmination of your influence. President Trump, you are not welcomed in Pittsburgh until you fully denounce white nationalism. Our Jewish community is not the only group you have targeted. You have also deliberately undermined the safety of people of color, Muslims, LGBT people and people with disabilities. Yesterday's massacre is not the first act of terror you incited against a minority group in our country. President Trump, you are not welcome in Pittsburgh until you stop targeting all and, and endangering all minorities. The murderer's last public statement in, invoked the compassionate work of Jewish of the Jewish Refugee Service, um, HIAS, at the end of a week in which you spread lies and sold fear about migrant families in Central America. He killed Jews in order to undermine the efforts of all those who find shared humanity with immigrants and refugees. President Trump, you are not welcome in Pittsburgh until you cease your assault on immigrants and refugees. President Trump, you are not welcome in Pittsburgh until you commit yourself to compassionate democratic policies that recognize the dignity of us all. That's from Jewish leaders in um, Pittsburgh. I think that's um, it's a powerful statement because it clearly outlines the intersection of all of these all, all, of, all of the various forms of hatred that are manifested in, in Donald Trump. I mean, God, like, I mean, he, Donald Trump is the personification of all these things. And yet you still do have people who are trying to say, oh, he's, you know, it's not all, you know, Trump's not the, the, the cause. He's a symptom. Well, yes, he's a symptom. But you know what? Any doctor, if we're going to go with this sickness metaphor, any doctor worth his weight, any doctor worth his or her uh, credentials is going to give you something for the symptoms first. No doctor is going to make you endure the suffering of your symptoms while they try to root out the cause, because sometimes the cause of your symptoms is not something that will ever go away. Like I said in the last segment, racism, fascism, white supremacy, those things are ideas. They are likely to never, ever be destroyed. You can't destroy an idea. But what you can do is beat it back into submission. Beat it back into the dregs of society. And what we have happening more than anything else right now are people who are trying to find every every way of understanding this except of what is at the core. What the, what's at the core of this is the literal decision by people that they prefer their hatred over overcoming their bigotry. Like there is a there is a decision point that is made. When, when it comes time to do these things, these, these things don't just happen. This type of bigotry doesn't just happen. The hatred that is that is used to to galvanize these groups, whether it be from Donald Trump or whether it be from conservative media uh, or, or the, the organizing these groups, whether it be organizing in neo-Nazis groups or or the, uh, 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 the alt right or whatever name you want to call them uh, these days. W there is a conscious decision that is made in every one of these of these movements, of these turning points in, in the minds of the individuals who either promote it or buy into it. You don't wake up and you get infected with racism like it's a flu. No, you make the literal decision that this is the road that you want to go down. And, and the reason I... I Pose it like that is because as, as people try to understand this from an economic of uh, the spread, particularly very specifically, they're trying to understand the spread of of white nationalism, white supremacy and fascism across the globe. And they're trying to understand it from a uh, uh, an economic um, framework. You completely leave out you, you infantilize them for one. But then, two, you completely leave out their decision points that they themselves as an individual chose to be a part of this. They chose white supremacy. They chose fascism. They chose ultra right wing conservatism that leads to violence. They chose this. They had the same decision point as the poorest of the poor members of Antifa who decided that. 
Yes, I'm just as poor as this racist, but I'm and as this Nazi, but I'm going to choose to punch this Nazi versus become a Nazi. There's a decision point that's made that is made outside of their economic plight. Maybe they are more susceptible to it, but only in the sense that al- like alcohol reveals who you really are. Poverty is really just going to reveal who you really are underneath what you've been groomed to be, what you've been raised to be. I, I'm going to get to the other, to, the fallacious side of this understanding of white supremacy, particularly the spread of white supremacy through an economic lens is fallacious and classist. But I want to get, just get to the autonomy, the autonomous decision that's made by every individual to embrace the bigotry versus reject the bigotry. That decision point is made by every individual. Nobody wakes up and says, oh, this morning I'm a Nazi and I don't know why. I just, I just, I just feel like I'm a Nazi. No, it is a literal decision that's made that is influenced by, by, by conservative media, by conservative talking points, by Breitbart, by all of these billions of dollars that are being spent by, by fascist billionaires. They are influenced by that, but it is still a decision that they make. And if we don't understand that decision point, then you're going to always be infantilizing them, removing their autonomy as though uh, their, their, their ability to think for themselves when in actuality they're making a very conscious decision. It's like you're trying to say that we can fix this if we just if we just help them out, fix the economy, fix the safety nets, and then maybe they won't be so susceptible to it. But you're making it seem as though it was a, a, a contagion that can be captured, that, that, that could be caught like a sickness that could be spread. And you completely rob them of the decision point that they made to embrace this. How do I know? Not only because there's so many poor working class people who are out here literally punching fascists. Who are who are some of the biggest advocates of anti-racism? Not only that, I know for myself. I know for myself because I, every single one of you, everybody listening to the sound of my voice, somewhere along your journey, journey, you had the opportunity to embrace bigotry, and you decided not to. I was raised in a homophobic environment. I was raised in that environment, not my, my not my immediate household, but our church. Church, black church in general, extremely homophobic. And there are black people who still embrace that. That is their decision. And they have to be held accountable for that decision. And you can't wash it away by saying, oh, if we only got rid of their economic anxiety, then they wouldn't be homophobes. I mean, because because black folks are broke. I mean, we could blame it on that, right? But we don't and we shouldn't. Likewise, men and misogyny. I, I mean, and, 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 and rape culture, it's, it's like you, you aren't infected with that. You, you, you learned that, but you also have a decision point that you made. I mean, my entire online persona and, and what I do could be, could be completely shaped around um, uh, uh, attacking women. Attacking black women specifically. I mean, there's a whole there's whole networks out there that make great money attacking black women because at some point you've been exposed to the same foolishness that they were. It's anti woman, anti black woman sentiment that is spread throughout every community. But you make a literal decision. Am I going to embrace this bigotry or am I going to reject this bigotry? And yet you have people on the outside of the conversation who are trying to make it say, oh, they wouldn't accept it if they weren't economically anxious. But that is that it, that goes contrary to the re- evidence at hand. Because I've been poor most of my life. I didn't choose to attack. I, I didn't choose not to attack women as a means of coming up because I wasn't economically desperate. Hell, I'm economically desperate now. <laughs> I chose not to attack women because I wanted to be better. I didn't want to be because I knew that that because I knew that doing that is was itself a scapegoat. And it was a very 
cognizant, conscious decision to reject that framework, to reject that worldview. And then there's also a a follow up decision that says not only am I going to reject that worldview, but now I'm going to fight against that worldview. And I think by robbing people of their autonomous, of their of their individual free will to make these decisions by saying that we can fix this by just addressing economic anxiety without paying any attention to those decision points. Without understanding that you are you are creating a, an understanding of racism and white supremacy that is woefully insufficient to addressing the causes of its spread. You're giving them an excuse. You're giving them a, you're, you're scapegoating. You're looking for uh, solidarity amongst class consciousness when when these people are consciously making the decision to do the opposite and the bigoted thing. Furthermore, you're 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 ignoring the. The vast evidence of poor people who are Antifa, who are anti-fascist, who are anti-racist, who have made the similar decisions that I made with regards to homophobia and with regards to misogyny. They make the same exact decision to say, not only do I reject that scapegoating of this particular group, but now I'm going to fight against that scapegoating. Damn, I wish I was a sociologist. I probably could break this down like with with literature. Uh, or a psychologist or some combination of the two. Racism, white supremacy, Nazism, fascism, all of it is a is a is a decision. It is a conscious decision that someone makes. About who they want to blame about, yes, their problems in life. But that decision has been made by so many of us who are just as poor and desperate as the rest of them. But we have said to ourselves that we are not going to scapegoat some marginalized group for our problems. We are looking to tear down the broader system. And it's the difference in that decision point that needs to be studied and needs to that. That's the best way to understand this, because that's the core and the root of it. But by blaming it on economics instead of their decision, you're robbing them of you're robbing us and you're robbing the, 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 the discourse. You're robbing our understanding of the spread of racism from that individual's decision and what drives them as a decision maker to to embrace the scapegoating. When there's been so many of us who are in the same exact economic despair who have rejected The scapegoating rejected the bigotry. And not only do we reject it, we actively fight against it. That is a way of understanding the spread. That is the way of understanding the spread without infantilizing people, without being classist yourself by exploring, by, 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 by casting the conversation about the spread of white supremacy and fascism as being only a product or we should only be concerned about the spread amongst the poor. And of course, you're not going to say that's what you're doing, but that is literally what you're doing when you try to explain every instance of white supremacy and the spread thereof as an economic paradigm. Not even considering the fact that the most dangerous fascists in the world are billionaires. One more segment coming. 